Welcome everyone to the next alumni career webinar about mediation skills sponsored by the Holy Cross Lawyers Association. Joining us today are a fantastic panel comprising John Lochnane from the class of 1987, Ed McDermott from the class of 1979, and Kristen Sloan Massini from the class of 1982. I'm Morris Sweeney, the Director of Alumni Career Development at Holy Cross, and I'm happy to welcome you to today's webinar offered exclusively for the Holy Cross community. We'll be together for an hour today. And after the formal presentation, John, Ed, and Kristen will take questions from you for as long as time allows. I encourage you to submit questions throughout this presentation by checking out the Q&A function located on the webinar control panel. We'll also be using the chat and we encourage you to submit your thoughts and your expertise through the chat as well. This presentation is recorded and will be made available to all participants in a few days. Now it's my pleasure to hand things over to today's speakers and let them take things from here. Thank you very much, Mara. This is John Lockdown speaking, uh, as mentioned, class of 87 and parent of 19, I'd like to add. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be on today's session with Kristen and Ed. A uh, little bit of background about myself. I'm a partner in the business department at Nutter uh, I'm pleased also to serve as, the chair, serve as the chair of the HCLA this year. Uh, my introduction to mediation came through my work uh, as a business lawyer, specifically dealing with commercial bankruptcy matters. I'm the chair of the American Bankruptcy Institute Mediation Committee, and I did my training in mediation at MWI in Boston. I also volunteer for uh, the district court pro bono mediators program at Suffolk County in Boston. Uh, Ed, a few words about yourself? Sure. Hi. Welcome, Crusaders. Uh, Ed McDermott here. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I graduated in 19, I want to say, 79. <laughs> Seems so long ago. Um, but my background quickly, because I don't like to get enmeshed in backgrounds, but I've been a trial attorney 25 years, and after that I had a, a um, a brief run with the Mass Trial Court as far as handling some of their interstate compact matters. And I've been involved in mediation off and on basically since 1982. Um, I also have the pleasure of coaching at the Holy Cross College um, mediation team. And I think I'll get into that in more detail. But in addition, I've coached the Holy Cross mock trial team since 1997. So welcome again and uh, happy to hopefully just share some ideas. And I like to say at the outset that I'm an expert in nothing, but I like to share at least all my mistakes with you and, and hopefully give you some thoughts. The key I think today is to at least having a discussion or a conversation with everybody, especially in these turbulent times along all the uh, canvases that we have before us about how we can make things better in a positive way by hopefully solving some problems. And that's pretty much the tenet of mediation. So I'm happy to be here again, and um, thank you again for uh, participating. Thank you, Maura, and I'm happy to be here with my colleagues, John and Ed. Um, I, uh, I appreciate what you said there, Ed, about uh, mediation trying to make things better. Um, just quickly, my background is in um, civil private practice. Uh, I didn't come to mediation until 2013 and then got pretty actively involved both uh, as a volunteer and in the district court program in Rhode Island as a board member at the Center for Mediation and Collaboration Rhode Island, where I'm still a board member. And um, also in my private practice, which I opened in 2017. Um, and just in March of this year, uh, opened a mediation uh, company with a law colleague. So this is sort of a new thing. Uh, but I believe a lot in it. I was lucky to meet John uh, through LinkedIn on a mediation uh, matter. I had uh, put something up there and we started and connected and quite a while ago, uh, John suggested we do uh, a mediation webinar. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. I was happy to be asked and um, looking forward to, uh, uh, to today. Great, thank you both, uh, Ed and Kristen. Again, a pleasure to be with you. Uh, it, for uh, just to get started here, I just wanted to note that mediation skills have never been more important, both in the practice of law and also in problem solving generally. So what we hope to, to cover today is how 
those skills can be used both in people's practices as, as attorneys and also uh, potentially in just solving other problems that exist. Uh, here's images of all of us, uh, in case you're wondering. Uh, Ed is the one in the middle on the upper right hand <laughs> photo. Uh, Not coaching, the younger. Yeah, <laughs> coaching the teams in action. Um, and uh, here's our agenda, but before we get into the agenda, I think uh, in order for us to get a sense of the audience, I think Mara is gonna put up two quick polls for us. So we'd like to just get a sense of people's background that are on the call. I, I know this is sponsored by the HCLA, uh, but people may be working in different industries uh, or maybe using mediation in different settings. Uh, so if you could just let us know what your professional background is, that would be helpful. That's question number one. And then tomorrow when we have the results of that, those will show, well, not surprisingly, 60% uh, nearly are in the legal field. We've got 20% on the business side um, with a smattering of others. And I think that's a pretty, that's a pretty helpful uh, result because mediation is used across all sorts of different industries and practices and professional fields. So that's good. And then we have a second poll that we want to just take quickly as well that Mauro will put up. just to gauge people's level of familiarity with mediation. So if you could just quickly let us know who we're talking to here, that would be helpful. Okay, and we'll see the results of this in a second. Uh, interesting. So we've got 67% uh, with very limited familiarity. Well, thank you so much for finding the program description of interest and joining us today. We've got 20% or 19% that have participated uh, and really only a few that have uh, extensive uh, participation or have actually served as a mediator. So that's quite interesting, that's helpful. Thank you for taking those polls. Let's get to our agenda. Um, we definitely we're going to start off with mediation basics and it sounds like Kristen we should not skip that slide so we will definitely get into mediation basics and Kristen will cover that for us then we're going to move okay. into medi mediation at Holy Cross and Ed will do that uh, since he is the mediation coach at the college and has a lot of familiarity and needless to say when uh, Kristen and I were students back in the 80s there was no such thing as a mediation program at the college so it's uh, interesting to hear what's going on at the Hill right now in that. Then we're going to move into lawyers as problem solving, uh, problem solvers and using mediation skills more broadly outside of the uh, legal field. We'll talk about some resources. We'll hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, so Mara, I mean uh, Kristen, uh, mediation basics. Thank you, John. Um... So we're going to start off just with the definition of mediation. Most of you, I'm sure, know what it is, and there are lots of definitions out there. But I have, um, I have two favorites. Uh, I like the short ones. The first one is a facilitated negotiation with a goal of finding resolution by mutual agreement. That's about the most concise definition I'm able to come up with. As a matter of fact, I liked it so much, I put it on my website. Um, but there's another definition I like a lot too, and um, I want to read this one to you because this one really appeals to me, a non-adversarial form of democratic decision making. And um, as the definition of mediation, I think this is possibly one reason why it appeals to a lot of people. Um, it's that aspect and element of control. Um, it's a process where you're, um, it's voluntary, it's self-determined, it's impartial, it's confidential, and all of those aspects, I think, give parties the uh, feeling of control and over their ultimate destiny. So um, there's our basic definition. And as many of you on the call uh, and on this webinar know, there are other types of um, dispute resolution, what we used to call alternative dispute resolution, and now we just call dispute resolution, uh, besides mediation, and sometimes they get a little bit mixed up, 
Uh, probably the most significant one many are familiar with is arbitration, which is different from mediation. And um, you know, arbitration generally is a private process where disputing parties agree that one uh, or several individuals can make a decision about the dispute after receiving evidence and a hearing. And the big difference is that an arbitrator sits generally as a finder of fact. So there's an individual who, um, who acts like a judge. Uh, that is a fundamental difference in mediation, where in mediation, a mediator is impartial, is not a fact finder, and um, facilitates. So um, that's a big difference. And you know, the arbitration process may be similar or it may be more formal, uh, where um, the fact finder, uh, the arbitrator rather finds facts, may use rules of evidence, may make a binding or non-binding decision. Uh, if, it's, if it's binding, it can become uh, um, an order of the court. If it's non-binding, it may just be advisory. So um, I think arbitration and mediation appeal to different types of folks for different reasons. And there are other types of dispute resolution, structured negotiation, uh, early neutral evaluation is kind of a new one that I'm seeing now where you take a 60 day period and sort of like speed dating or, you know, sort of like speed law, you take 60 days and try to resolve it in a collaborative fashion. Um, you know, generally, those of you who are familiar with collaborative law know that some decisions are made where you share experts, you share reports. Uh, it's, it's sort of a, um, a hybrid, a blending of a litigation process and a self-directed process. Anyway, so there are a number of, uh, a number of other processes besides mediation. Um, but mediation is what we're focusing on today because we like the thought of it being more democratic and more um, uh, that the parties are in control of their ultimate destiny. Um, and then as far as training options, um, we'll talk a little bit more about actual, uh, actual entities that you can contact for training, but there's a lot of training out there. Uh, in the New England area, there's some very good training at an entity in uh, the Boston area called MWI, um, and we'll talk about them a little bit later. Uh, but basically, it's 40-hour training most um, States have a requirement that you have to have 30 or 40 hours training. I believe Massachusetts is 40. I believe Rhode Island is still 30. And um, the idea being that you can learn basic skills and uh, how to mediate. Um, the entity that I am on the board, the Center for Mediation and Collaboration Rhode Island here in Providence, Rhode Island, has a program, a basic mediation training program. Uh, it's actually 40 hours long and all the graduates are able to enter our district court training program. So they are then assigned to the various district courts to help out with the uh, district court calendar, which is largely landlord tenant type matters, debts owed, that kind of thing. So training options, um, it's a wonderful thing. It's even better if you can get some, uh, some practice once you have completed training. Um, and then finally, mediation and law practice. Um, you know, it's a tricky thing because, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about the, the legal approach and the mediation approach in a little bit. John will talk about that a bit. Um, but they are separate things. And I found this out myself because when I started my law practice, I wanted to also do mediation, but realized I couldn't really talk to folks in the same way. Um, if they were coming to see me for one or the other. Um, in other words, if they were coming for mediation and started to tell me all about their case, I certainly couldn't be a neutral mediator. So anyway, um, there are programs in the courts for uh, mediation, which is great. Those are growing. A lot of them have started in the district courts, but they go in Rhode Island anyway, right up through our uh, federal district court that has a very robust mediation program. Um, in private practice, I would say that there are lots of lawyers who mediate and, and, and do publicize that they are mediators. Um, and uh, a lot of them are doing various forms of case settlement or negotiation. And I think all of that's good. And I think we're going to talk a little bit about those skills. Um, because um, even though med mediation is a discrete thing, 
the kinds of skills that we want to talk about today uh, are, are um, the kinds of negotiation skills that might help you in your own practices and in your own fields if it's not the legal field. Kristen, thank you very much. That's uh, a great discussion of mediation basics in five minutes, uh, which is not easy to do. I love your definition. I'll have to go check out your website. Um, one thing I just want to emphasize, um, I, I think it should be understood, but it's probably worth emphasizing, is that there are plenty of people who are mediators who are not lawyers. There's no requirement to have a law degree to be a mediator. In fact, if you go to one of these 30 or 40 hour training providers, uh, in all likelihood, there'll be people from social service programs, education, healthcare, and other areas who are training to be mediators. The reason in Massachusetts somebody would go to a training program is that Massachusetts state law provides that if you've, if you've uh, completed one of these training programs, then anything said before you in a mediation session um, is not discoverable. So in order to have the benefit of the law that uh, protects the confidentiality of information, you want to be in compliance with Massachusetts state law, which says you have completed a 30 or 40 hour training session. Uh, and I think other states may have similar laws as well. Thanks for bringing that up, John. That's an, a really important point. We do have a law like that in Rhode Island and the protection of that statute is really important for confidentiality. Um, so thanks. Exactly, uh, especially for the party's willingness to be able to share uh, with the mm -hmm. mediator. Okay, so let's get to, uh, Let's get to Ed, who's going to tell us what's happening uh, on the Hill with mediation. What's happening? Well, thank you both. Um, let me give you a little bit of um, update since, as John said, and Kristen, they graduated like I did before the dawn of the enlightened age up on Holy Cross, Mount Bacchai. Uh, I start, I got to get a little backstory to explain this. I've been imbued with light here, so I'm kind of like a, in the clerk's protector program. Um, I started the mock trial program at Holy Cross with the pre-law advisor, Scott Sandstrom, in 1997. It developed uh, rather quickly from that point on. Uh, we've been handling, I mean, we've been I've been coaching for now over 20 years, the mock trial program. So in 2006, we also entered the world of moot court. And as you all know, moot court is a different animal than mock mock trial. Mock trial is a simulated trial. You have three attorneys, three witnesses on each side. You go up against other schools and universities, which we've done successfully, for, as they say, for 20 years, um, in spite of my lack of talent. Um, and they've done fabulous. But mock trial is not cut out for every student. And I, I started to realize that probably around five, six years ago. I noticed that mock trial was becoming so competitive uh, that some of the students who tried out for mock trial were, were just not wired that way. So at the behest of a good friend of mine, Ed Stern, who's the assistant dean at BU and a colleague who's been coaching mock trial for 20 years with me, he kept prodding me to try to join this mediation, undergraduate mediation uh, comp, uh, program. And at, at the outset, I just said, you know, there was some resistance on my part only because you know, I think a mediation is kind of an off the beaten path, so to speak. It's not, it's not the same as litigation, obviously. Lawyers are trained to mostly try cases or to, to handle legal matters in a legal context. So after about three years of him pushing prodding, I finally went down one weekend and watched one of the mediation tournaments at Northeastern Law School because they run this on the law school level and on the undergrad level. And halfway through one of the first rounds, I suddenly, it dawned on me, like light on marble head. I said, our students at Holy Cross can do this and they can do this very well. So that was the impetus to getting the program for mediation going, which I did in 2015. Uh, we've successfully competed over the last five years. As a matter of fact, we won the, um, the nationals last year, it's top undergrad mediator program in the country, which uh, the students were, were very uh, thrilled about, as was I. And we also competed over in Athens at the International Law School Tournament um, a year ago. So again, backing up, the Holy Cross now offers three different trial programs under the aegis of the, of the masthead of the J.D. Powers 
uh, Center for Experiment Experiential Learning, which is a fabulous thing. If you get a moment to check it out, everything's on website up there. But so we still have mock trial flourishing. We have moot court, which started in 2006. And now we have the mediation program. So we have three, I call them items on the menu, which you can select from as a student. And I think that's wonderful only because as John said, and Kristen said, it wasn't available back, at, back in the dark ages in the wagon covered wagons when I was there, but it's a great opportunity for students to one, improve their public speaking abilities. And at the same time, number two, uh, enhance their critical analytical uh, skill sets. So as I've said over the years, and I hope I fall into this category, Holy Cross students do two things well to Holy Cross grads. They write well and they speak well. And I think that's one of the hallmarks to the Holy Cross education. That's my personal opinion. So again, mediation is a much more user-friendly atmosphere for some students who are not wired to be vicious um, litigation attorneys like John Lockmine. <laughs> Sorry, John, I'm just picking on you. So these are students who, are, who don't have that, shall we say, um, assertiveness or combativeness or whatever that we all know occurs inside of a courtroom. A courtroom is, and, and with all due respect, I've done it for 25, 30 years, it's, it's combat, combat in a, in a civil context, but it's still combat. The problem with trying cases is one person wins and the other person loses. And that's the risk that we all take when we try a case, as Kristen and John very well know. Mediation, however, affords the party, or parties rather, to retain control of their case. In other words, they can go to mediation, they can explore it, they can un in in evaluate their case, hear the other side's position, hear their side's position. And at that point, if they're not happy, they can walk away. It's purely voluntary, as Kristen said. So, so anyway, so mediation at Holy Cross is alive and well. Moot Court is alive and well. They've, they've done fabulous. One of my former students, John O'Donnell, who's a partner at a Hartford Law Firm, he runs the Moot Court program now, and they've finished in the top five in the country in the Moot Court. And, media, and again, mock trial is still going strong too. So it affords a student who otherwise might be not the most, shall we say, uh, acerbic person to st still go out, still develop and enhance their public speaking skills by doing mediation. So that's kind of the, um, the current state of affairs. Now, as far as what alums could do to help us in, in some measure, and, and you've been fabulous in the past, and I appreciate that. Kristen came up and actually gave a talk to the uh, mediation and moot court. I think everybody, you hit the mock trial in the moot court um, crew a couple of years ago. John's been fabulous. Last year's helping getting out the notice. We, we handle or we, we host a tournament rather, a mediation tournament every year. And we're gonna hopefully, we're planning on doing it next March. Unfortunately, our March tournament this year had to be canceled because of cousin COVID who came down and, and rained terror on us. We, but hopefully we have that resolved thanks to our, our fellow alum, Dr. Fauci, by the end of the year, maybe. That might be our Christmas present, let's hope. Um, but we, we will be hosting a tournament next March. Um, and we would uh, love to have any alums who can give us a half a day um, or a whole day if possible to come back to campus to sit in and judge one of these mediation tournaments. We get teams from around the country, north, west, south, you get your name at east, and we, um, we need judges because without judges, we, we unfortunately don't have a way to uh, figure out who, who figures, finishes on top and who doesn't finish on top. So that's something that we would mo very much appreciate. I know mediation, I mean, I'm sorry, Moot does the same thing. They run a big tournament, uh, usually in December. So any help the alums could lend towards judging would be wonderful. If any of you have any specific questions or want to outreach to myself, um, and Mara's giving you our contact number, uh, contact info, that would be great also. So 
please don't be shy about jumping in because both all of these three uh, trial team opportunities are flourishing at Holy Cross, thank goodness. The students really enjoy them. It's their chance to compete really as an academic team. It, it's more than, it's not a club. This is not a club. We compete on the intercollegiate level, as I say, around the country. And the camaraderie that they develop on all of these teams is just wonderful to see. They bond friendships that last for life. I've got students that were on my 2000 mock trial team that are now, get, I'm getting invited to their weddings all the time, which is wonderful. And I'm honored that they do that. But it's just a, a great, great vehicle for students to enhance their, uh, cap their abilities, so the skill sets at Holy Good. Cross. And thank you so much for, for that description uh, and a you know, phenomenal job uh, hearing about the success of Holy Cross students. Uh, we know that, uh, that the admissions director there uh, only lets in the, uh, the folks that are really gonna succeed there. But uh, once they're there, it's up to folks like you to uh, shape them and mold them. So um, it's tremendous to have so much success across different areas. Thank you. Did you want to mention just briefly uh, this organization, uh, the International Academy of Dispute Resolution? Sure, this is the, uh, as it says, INADR. That, that is the clearinghouse organization for all law school mediations and all undergrad mediations. If you have a minute or you're interested to go to their website, they just put up actually a new website, which is much, much better than it was before. I think it's INA, INADR.org but just Google INADR, International Academy of Dispute Resolution. They're out of Chicago. They've been around 15, 20 years. They, uh, they put out the cases uh, for the mediation tournaments. Um, they're fictitious cases. They're only usually two or three pages in length each case. So what we do once we, we get the cases two weeks before a tournament, it, that's when the rubber meets the road. I have to sit down with the students I let them kind of diagram the fact patterns, come up with strategies uh, on both sides because you, you may have either side of the case. They're gonna flip a coin at the, in the day of the tournament. You don't know which side of the case you're gonna have. For instance, in a domestic dispute or, or a divorce case, you might have the husband, you might have the wife. And there are all types of different cases. Um, there's, there's civil cases, uh, domestic cases, contract cases, you, you name it. So, but that's a great website. And they actually have a lot of material on their website that will explain in more detail than I could as to what's yeah. what's going on. And actually, we're still listed on there a couple of uh, results on the on the web page, which is great also. So, that's fabulous. Thank you again. Uh, and I just can't sure. emphasize enough um, that if you're going to be involved in mediation, you definitely want to get involved in coaching and giving back and and participating. It's a great way to network with other mediators who are doing the same. Um, in addition to programs that exist, such as the one Ed described at Holy Cross, uh, area law schools um, sometimes are looking for mediators to come in and help with their coaching program. I've done that at BC Law in the past. Uh, and I think other area law schools uh, often have that type of need as well. So um, it's just part of being a mediator is uh, collaborating with others in training. It's just, a, it's just a, so it comes with the territory. Um, next thing we're going to talk about here is, uh, is actually something that Ed covered a little bit, uh, in, in a way, through his description of the various programs at Holy Cross. So mm -hmm. we have the traditional legal approach, and then we have sort of the, uh, <clears throat> the other approach. Uh, so I'm going to cover the traditional legal approach. <clears throat> excuse, excuse me one second. Well, we could always do it the other way around if you need a breath there, John. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my water, so I should be good, but please bail me out of the city. Yeah. Happy, to, happy to back into that one if you want. So I think we could do this relatively quickly because I think Ed sort of described this uh, when he was talking about the moot court, uh, about the trial teams. Um, you know, what they teach you in law school is very much centered around case disputes. You know, you read opinions. Um, it's very, um, uh, it's the adversarial system in action. Um, lawyers are trained to define issues, to identify legal solutions, develop positions, and articulate and advocate for those positions. That is the essence of what a legal education 
uh, is the core of the legal education in the United States. Now, as I mentioned, there are law schools now that are teaching mediation skills. I mean, if you're, I think, a third year and you want to take an elective in mediation skills, there are programs like that, I think, available, but it's not the center of a legal education. Legal, the center of a legal education in the United States, as we all know, I think, is, is around these core the system, uh, these core traits that define the adversarial system. Um, so uh, litigators uh, are, you know, schooled to do these things to prepare for trial. Um, Ed, you, uh, thank you for the shout out earlier. Uh, um, I won't be offended that you called me a litigator. I'm actually a business lawyer. Uh, but as I mentioned, my, my background is in, uh, you know, I, when I got out of law school, the economy was pretty much in bad shape like it is now. So the opportunities were in commercial bankruptcy. And uh, the one thing about commercial bankruptcy is that time is money. And um, although there are things to worth, that are worth writing about uh, in investing years and years to fight about it, in most situations, uh, there's a deal to be had. And um, there's, a, uh, there's a natural sort of mediation aspect of a lot of what goes on in a commercial bankruptcy case. And uh, although I didn't get trained formally until a couple of years ago, and I didn't really stop paying more attention to this until I was well into my legal career, um, uh, it's possible to be it's possible to be aware of both skill sets. So uh, I think you should come into this field knowing that law school trains you to really approach things in one way. There's an entirely different way to think about solving problems that might actually be in the client's interest. So it's good to be aware of those things. And Kristen's going to dive down deeper into the details of that. Thanks, John. Um, and thank you for that recap of the, uh, the litigation uh, traditional problem solving mindset. I think I would say I have great respect for that and glad I was trained in that discipline. But um, uh, after years of hearing clients um, talk about non-legal aspects of their case, and also having to say things to them like, that's not relevant to your court case. Um, that seemed to take on a bigger and bigger piece. And I think a lot of people felt like litigation and the process itself was something of a straitjacket with respect to what they wanted to say, what they needed, what their goals and objectives were. So I guess I would say that a mediation skills mindset is uh, a broader mindset and uh, I want to reiterate that I'm, I'm, I'm still using my, my legal mind, but I, I am thinking more broadly. Um, number one, trying to learn how to be a better listener. Um, active listening, listening to everything folks say and not judging it as that's relevant, that isn't, as I found I used to uh, in a legal context. So, it's very important, I think, with the mediation skills mindset to start with active listening because you can get all kinds of things early on from people, legal and non-legal, that really reflect what their goals and objectives are without even having to ask a question. You can get the emotion, you can get some facts, you can get priorities. Um, so active listening, I think, is the most important thing. Um, and then I, I think you have on the next uh, facilitate before you evaluate. And that's so true. Basically, that's just attention to process. The process of validating what you're hearing or perhaps summarizing what you're hearing to make sure that the client understands uh, that you understand them. And that's not a typical lawyer approach. We, we like to say, yep, we've got it. We march ahead. This process, I think, requires us to listen carefully, repeat some of what we've heard, um, whether we think it's legal or uh, relevant or whatever we think about it, doesn't really matter because it is relevant and important to the client. So um, uh, listening, summarizing, reframing, facilitating the process, making sure that the client still feels good about what they're saying and doing, they're being heard. Um, to get to identifying options, you have to really put your forward thinking hat on. Um, you have to suggest to the client uh, to help you prioritize what matters most to them. And uh, I think Ed, you had mentioned, or perhaps it was you, John, who said time is money. Um, I remember when I was first thinking about mediation, I kept coming up with this image of a peace sign with time, 
money and peace of mind. That's just the way I was thinking about mediation all the time. And I think that at that point, that is still what I think about at the identify options section, session uh, or, or part of a communication with, a, uh, with parties. Time, money, and peace of mind. They have to decide what's most important to them at that point. And then the options become clearer and the priorities become clearer. So then you move into alternatives. And these alternatives are usually driven by the parties themselves based on how they've established their priorities. Um, and we have at the end there, BATNA, best alternative to a uh, negotiated agreement. That's one of those terms that you will see in uh, all negotiation circles. I'm sure many of our folks on today are familiar with that, but it's a really important um, step to take in all negotiations, not just in mediation, but you've got to know that if this whole thing falls apart, if nothing happens, if I make no progress, if somebody walks out or whatever, what is my best alternative to what I could do here? That's got to be in your, uh, in your thought process as well, because that might help you decide whether it matters to go forward or it, you, should, you should stop where you are. Um, I've also heard WATNA, worst, worst alternative to a negotiated agreement. Can't say I always think about that, but people do think about that um, because time is money, as John said. So um, with this broader mindset, um, the client, the parties drive uh, where you ultimately uh, arrive at. And um, I guess that's all we have on that one. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Very, very well said. Um, we did have a poll that I wanted to try to get a, an answer to uh, for those of you that are familiar with uh, traditional legal problem solving. And I, I wanted to see if we get a reaction to uh, this question. Um, in your experience, traditional legal problem solving, please pick one of those four. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can get a read on that from the audience. Because everything Kristen just talked about is an alternative to the traditional legal adversarial system. And then after we get those poll results, uh, we'll go back to Ed to talk about more of the value that uh, mediation can bring. So when the poll results are in, uh, 6% uh, think that it's highly effective in allowing parties to achieve objectives in a cost-effective and timely manner. 44% uh, say, you know what, it, it, it typically can allow parties to achieve objectives, but it can be expensive and or slow. And then 33% say it's generally as expensive, time-consuming, and often seems to exacerbate problems, not solve them. 17% not sure. So I guess looking at these results, um, uh, now, there's, there's definitely a percentage to think that uh, the adversarial system works just fine. Um, and uh, then there's, a, a, there's a, a large group that think that um, it can work, but it can be expensive and time consuming. Um, so Ed, do you wanna take us into uh, our next slide? Um, let me see if I can advance you here. Oh, sorry, I'm looking for my advanced toe. Oh, here it is, sorry. There you go. Uh, you want to go through the, the value of the mediation skills approach. And again, this isn't necessarily to, to commit people to engage in an actual mediation. It's just to think about uh, a mediation approach to a client's uh, or a, 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 an individual's uh, problem. Great, thank you, John. So again, we not keeping it to a formality, the, the, the big benefit I believe to mediation is that the parties retain control. Again, I think I mentioned it's, they, they control their destiny. They're going to um, a form which they're not used to, although they're not used to court either. They're going there with lawyers, which is fine. We all like lawyers. But I think the first issue that has to be broached with the client and, and the lawyer is this is not court. In other words, that this is a informal setting, which is great. It alleviates a lot of stress and anxiety on the part 
of the participants, the, the uh, parties, as we call them, as you know. Also, it allows the uh, clients of the parties to get the viewpoint from the other person's shoes. And I think that's extremely important. They have a dispute, no doubt. They, it's probably highly charged and emotional. And this is gonna be their first opportunity to sit across the table at a conference room instead of a court again and hear what the other side has for a position on the issue. So that's good. That's, that's an educational opportunity for lawyers to have their clients be educated. And anybody who's practiced law, and I know a lot of you have, how many times have you sat down with a client and spent a lot of time trying to um, convey different ideas or postures or, or evaluate the case with the client and they, they just, after a while, they don't wanna hear it. They almost become immune to listening to their own attorney. And it's human nature. Nobody wants to hear the bad things about their case, especially from their own lawyer, but that's a lawyer's job. A lawyer has to evaluate the case and give them, him or her, their best advice as to you know, what to do with the case so to speak, go to trial, no, don't go to trial, let's go to mediation. Mediation, I think, is a great tool for lawyers because it gets the client to listen to the other side, appreciate, hopefully, or hear it from somebody else, which again, that'll be a second dose as to what the, there's always pluses and minuses to every case. Otherwise, they throw up their hands. When they see McDermott walk in the room, they always used to throw their hands up and say, how much does he want? We'll just pay him whatever he wants. So that's a great um, uh, piece of mediation. Now, as far as the underlying interests and in ultimate goals, there's a lot of things that drive that are, that are hidden beneath the service, current surface. And I think Kristen started to touch up on this as far as emotions and feelings of the clients. So again, this is a good time for them, the parties to look across the table and there's an opportunity through the mediation process. I mean, the, the process is gonna be driven by the mediator or mediators. And as I always say, and a good mediator will say this, I'm not here to settle your case. That's not my role. My role here as a mediator is to facilitate the exchange of ideas and information and creative solutions. You two are gonna settle your case. I'm not gonna settle your case. The lawyers aren't gonna settle your case. So, and then there's opportunities for breakout sessions, as you know, with mediation, you get together and then you caucus and you break off into separate uh, uh, breakout sessions. And then the client gets to have a moment to reflect upon what he or she heard, digest it, then the lawyer can reemphasize uh, what it is that they need to reemphasize so that it's, it, it gets absorbed better by the client. The other thing, and it's been touched upon, I can't emphasize it enough, is that the clients have to listen. They have to listen. If they go there, pre, go there predetermined that my lawyer is gonna win this case for me, it's not gonna work. Because lawyers really, with all due respect, they don't have a huge role in the mediation. They're babysitting their clients. Again, the clients have to interchange. And as a good media will also say, in my opinion, nobody wins at mediation. What do I mean by that? It sounds like why are we on, why are we wasting Mara's time here with this webinar then? Because mediation should lead, should ultimately lead to a meeting of the minds of the parties where they may, parties may not be totally happy with the result of the settlement, but it's a better option, as Kristen said, than going forward in litigating where you could lose your case totally. So then the last piece here, and I will shut up, is considerations of time, money, and peace. I always quote, I don't even know if he's still alive, former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Warren Berger, who was quoted, and it was a while ago too, in the late 70s, I believe, if he was still on the bench, that litigation is too time consuming, it's too costly, and it's too combative. And he was a big advocate of, and back in the day, of, of suggesting mediation to the parties because you can set it up quickly. Your lawyers can set up the mediation quickly. It's cost effective, 
probably cost $500. At least that was the going rate when I was doing it. $500 for a two and a half hour, three hour session. You can book another session if you can't resolve it during the first mediation. So, and again, as the old adage, and I hate to quote the author, the most recent author, but what, what do you have to lose? Give it a try. So thank you, thank you, Ed. And uh, maybe just, uh, I think we're probably gonna get to questions in a second, but maybe, uh, you know, listening to you and to Kristen, uh, one point sort of drives home. Um, you know, if, if your case, if, if this, the situation you have needs to go to trial, then bring it to trial, right? Get yourself a good trial lawyer and bring it to trial. Um, I don't sit here thinking that mediation is the cure-all for, for everything or is the perfect solution or that you're always going to be successful in getting a dispute resolved in mediation. Some things, I think, need to go to trial. Uh, uh, and for that, you want an excellent trial lawyer um, who is going to uh, win at that game. Uh, I think the, the point here is that uh, mediation is playing an increasingly expanded role. I certainly see that in the commercial bankruptcy world where people um, value the opportunity to try to craft their own solution in a way that uh, allows more flexibility than potentially a judge could sort of impose upon them. So I do see mediation trending. Um, uh, and these things coexist. It's not like one versus the other. They, they you know, these are options that ex exist out there for, for people to consider in solving problems. Um, I think we saw some questions come in both in the Q&A function and also in the chat. So Mara, do you want to help us uh, with that? Yes, absolutely. Um, yes, and everyone, just as a reminder, you can type in your questions to the Q&A and, and it's easier for us to monitor them um, through that forum. The first one that came in um, is an alum who said, I am participating in a mediation for the first time to handle a construction contract dispute. The actual mediation will take place in August, but the mediator is requesting that the parties submit position papers prior to the mediation. Do you have suggestions on what to highlight for the mediator in the position papers and what we should focus our paper on? I'd, I'd be happy to take that more or at least take a stab at that. Um, Lauren, the first time I got involved in something like this, um, the lawyers delivered bankers boxes full of pleadings to me, <laughs> paper. So I learned the hard way um, that from, a, from another experienced mediator that um, a very short paper to the mediator um, with the issues uh, and what is most important to your client. And that's a little different than the issues. So um, the very, I find what's helpful is the very last um, round of negotiation, if you can sort of update the mediator on where the case stands now, because, of course, people initiate mediation at any stage. Um, I'm not sure uh, what stage you are at, um, what stage of litigation you're at, but assuming you, a case has been filed, letting the mediator know what stage you're at in litigation, what the rub is, you know, what the last round of um, impasse was, and then what are the issues? even without resolution or suggestion. You can argue a little bit, but you know, keep it short. And um, uh, what is important to your client? What's the most important thing to your client? I guess I would say, I think you can do that in three pages. Yeah. Um, and that's helpful. What do you think, John? Kristen, yeah, thank you so much. I totally agree. A mediator is not a judge. A mediator is not a fact finder. A mediator does not want to get down to the nitty gritty of the facts of who did what to whom and when and how and why. and that is not what a mediation is about. A mediation is a self-determination process by the parties to try to achieve their, their interests, um, which will be better than the alternatives that they may face. So I think if you're thinking about, uh, first off, you should know your mediator. Um, hopefully you've got a mediator that's familiar with construction disputes, right? You don't want to have a domestic relations right. expert handling a concern. So hopefully you, you've got a good mediator who's familiar with the issues, probably handled many, many disputes in this type of fashion. Uh, that person does not want the banker's boxes. That person wants exactly what Kristen just said. They want to get a sense of what's going on here. What are the obstacles to reach a, solu a solution? Um, one important thing is to figure out, mediators handle these things differently. Is the, is the mediation statement going to be shared with the other side? 
or is it going to go to the mediator directly right. and only for the mediator's eyes only? And right. you should have clarity on that um, because there might be some things you don't want the other side to see right away, uh, but you want the mediator to know about. So if you're not sure about that, make sure you get clarity on that. That's a great point. Ed, any additional thoughts on that question? No, out of my league. I never did contracts or construction, so I, I rest with your good judgment, you and Kristen. Fantastic, thank you. And another question came in uh, while you were speaking. Someone wrote that they're helping friends who are a married couple with young kids during a separation. What would you say is the ideal timeline of divorce in order to avoid excessive costs and to preserve the peace? Well, family law is not uh, totally in my wheelhouse, but I do know that many mediators will help with a property settlement agreement. So um, a savings of, of uh, money could be in ha going to a mediator who might help you with that piece of it. Because then if you are um, proceeding with a divorce, you've got a prop property settlement agreement done by a mediator and it was done collaboratively. If you can get that done, that's great. Um, I, although I'm not sure I'm answering the question because you're asking the ideal timeline of divorce. I guess I would say after you mediate a property settlement agreement with a mediator would probably be an advantageous time. Um, I don't know, Ed or John, again, that's out of my wheelhouse. What do you, either of you have a thought on that? Well, I know that the, it's mandatory in Massachusetts um, probate and family court that you submit to a mediation. Every case right. has to do that. I can, I can guess, uh, you lay a, a personal story, not my own, <laughs> but maybe. Um, somebody who I was very, uh, actually I knew from Holy Cross, uh, recently went through that very uh, unfortunate uh, period of their lives. And they actually, he and his uh, ex, or uh, wife that became ex, went to a professional mediator for family for divorce mediation. And they went through the process of mediation and the, the mediator had a recommendation and came out with basically a, a proposed uh, division of marital assets and so forth. There was no custody involved. The kids were all grown, thank God. Somebody they knew from, as they say, from the cross. Um, and I'm not casting aspersions, but I guess the wife didn't want to go along with the recommendation of the mediator and they ended up actually trying the case, which is very unusual to have to try a case in the probate and family court. It takes about a year and a half to get a trial and the judge, it's on a jury trial, it's a judge trial. And the judge took about six months to get a, a written findings after that. Point of the story being is the judge came down almost exactly with what the mediator had recommended two years before and it cost them each $50,000 in legal fees. So point of the story is if you go to a professional mediation a divorce mediator, you know, give, give some long and hard thought and pause to, you know, then um, resolving the case. Yeah, the only thing I would add to, to that, uh, Ed and Kristen, and again, this is totally outside of my area, but uh, I think it comes back to the point of uh, the parties are engaged in a consensual process with a mediator. They both have to have faith in that mediator, right? So, um, you know, if somebody doesn't like the mediator, it's not likely to be a successful process. So, you know, one of the, um, uh, and, the and again, the mediator is not deciding anything. So uh, uh, as, a, as a party that's got a problem that involves another person, uh, you want to make sure that you've selected somebody that the other party is going to have faith in and can actually help you, you know, and them uh, try to get to a solution. Uh, so I would just be uh, very uh, aware of the importance of mediation select, mediator selection at the outset. So uh, Mara, do we have any other questions? Yeah, another question that came in from registration that I think is, it came in a few times, so I, I think it's worth addressing is, um, you know, in your opinions, what would you say is the biggest obstacle in mediations? Um, And maybe you just lawyers. It. <laughs> lawyers. And I mean that with all due respect. 
I think sometimes lawyers go at mediation like it's a mini trial mm. and they, there's a lot of uh, grandstanding and um, not grandstanding in a bad way, but they, they, they you know, they, they want to make the noise is what, is what I call it. And mediation is not the forum for that. It's, it's, to, you know, everyone to kind of decompress and kind of relax and it's stressful, no doubt, but I think mediators can be a big impediment. And that's just my personal opinion. I'm not saying it happens all the time, but sometimes I think that they approach it, unfortunately, on the basis of this is like a mini trial. So I'm going to convince the mediator that we're right and the other side's wrong. And again, that's not the goal of mediation. It's not right or wrong. It's mutual resolution. It's walking away with an agreement that both parties can live with. Not every, you don't get a hundred percent on each side. You get, you get a piece of it, but, as an old, old judge once told me, if neither side is happy with the settlement, then it means it's a good settlement. <laughs> Sorry, that's, that's what the old judge told me. You know, I think what John said, oh, thank you, Ed, I think you're right. Um, I think that in order for um, it to be effective with lawyers, the, the lawyers and the mediator have to work out how they're gonna work together ahead of time. Um, everybody has to have a role. And, um, but I, I want to emphasize also what John said before about trust in the mediator. I guess that's what came to my mind first before you jumped in, Ed, and said lawyers. And I, I do think you're right. But um, mm -hmm. when John mentioned trust in the mediator, I think if one party doesn't trust or one party thinks, oh, the, if, it's a, if it's a divorce matter, the spouse picked the mediator, it can be tainted from the get-go. And unless both parties are... Uh, trusting of this individual who's the mediator, you're not going to get anywhere. And I think it's very important that the mediator be mindful that the mediator's job is to keep relationship with the parties, that you have to tend to it. And that means listening well, that means validating what you're hearing, not judging what you're hearing or applying any kind of evaluative posture at the outset. Uh, even if eventually you do use some evaluative skills, it's tending to the relationship, continuing to communicate, getting behind positions and finding out what the real interests are. And I think if you can continue to do that in a steadfast way, you, you build trust. So you need to have some trust at the start and you need as a mediator to keep earning it all the way through the process. And I think that's critical to, uh, or, or that's the converse of what was asked. What's the biggest obstacle? Lack of trust. Yeah, if I could just weigh in there, and I, I see another question had to do with when or how to start a mediation between two parties. So I'll try to tackle that, plus what's the biggest obstacle question. I agree with what's been said. I also think that tunnel vision is an obstacle, right? The parties sometimes have been so down, so far down their rabbit hole that they really just don't see any other issues beyond what they've been sort of debating. And uh, the process for a mediation really goes to sort of sometimes how a room is set up, right? People don't, a, a successful mediator won't have people sort of sitting across from each other necessarily at a table. He'll, he'll, he or she will arrange the room maybe as a circular table. And, you know, the enemy is the problem. The enemy is not the other side. So once people start, uh, engaging a mediator in both the joint session where all the parties are present and also in the separate caucus session where it's just the mediator and one of the parties, people can start to brainstorm and think about really what it is that they want and other ways to get around this problem that they, you know, is a joint thing that they share. So I think that the tunnel vision can be an obstacle. Um, when to start, you know, I think sometimes with mediation, there's an issue about when do you start? Is it a sign of weakness to suggest mediation? A lot of times mediation will happen just before trial starts. I would encourage folks um, to think about starting mediation much earlier than that, potentially, right? You can go down your trial path. Uh, I know resources are sometimes limited, but you can potentially go down a trial path, but uh, keep open the possibility of exploring mediation at an earlier stage, uh, perhaps before the relationship has soured so much that people can't even be in the same room together. Um, and I guess I know there was a question too about remote mediation at some point I saw. Yeah. Uh, and um, I think uh, just to handle that quickly, I would just say that remote mediation is being used uh, effectively these days. 
Um, people have problems, they need to get their problems solved. Um, everybody agrees that being in the same room, working with a mediator in person is the preferred way to go. But uh, the technology that Zoom and other providers have of breakout rooms and, and uh, uh, convening people can certainly work uh, even in this day and age. Yeah, and I would just add, John, that um, I am using it right now. Um, I'm using a couple of different forms, but um, Zoom is a good one because of the breakout rooms. And um, I do some mediating for uh, in the educational field and uh, teachers, school departments, families, that kind of thing. And um, we've done some fully online using Zoom. Uh, there's another forum called Legaler, which I like very much. Um, and some of our district courts are using WebEx, you know, Cisco's WebEx. But um, yeah, these can be done fully online. And uh, if people are motivated and it's the breakout room function of those three, um, of those three providers that I think makes it possible to be successful um, and, and, and do a good job because you're able to talk privately in private caucus and uh, um, I think people feel, uh, feel as good as you can feel in an online environment. Thank you, Thank you Kristen. Uh, Mara, um, before you tell us whether there's any other questions that we should address, I just wanted to mention for folks that one of the slides uh, does include uh, a sampling of various resources. There's a ton of resources out there in mediation. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but uh, here is the website that Ed mentioned earlier, his presentation as well as a few articles and a few organizations that folks can check out uh, to get a start. You know, just start following some of these on Twitter or LinkedIn or you know, subscribe to their, uh, their email newsletters and you can start learning and, and expanding your knowledge of, of mediation. Um, Mara, anything else that folks wanted to have us tackle? Yeah, it looks like there's one more question. I know we're over the hour mark, so thank you to everyone for, for sticking yeah. with us. Um, it's great to be able to address all of your questions. Um, the last question that came through was um, about what happens when mediation doesn't help the parties reach an agreement? Then what would, then how do you proceed? John, what would you say? You either get back in the queue in litigation um, or you initiate litigation if it has not happened. So you haven't really lost anything. You either, you either step aside from whatever the litigation posture is and then agree to go back to it or if um, you put all your eggs in the mediation basket doesn't pan out uh, then perhaps you agree to try uh, you you decide rather to to file a case um, but there are other dispute options as well too like arbitration as well ed john do you have anything to suggest on that my feeling is that again i hate to be so trite but uh, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Even if the mediation fails, um, it really hasn't failed. Because in past cases that I've been involved with as a litigator, now you've used it kind of as a informal um, discovery tool. In other words, you've pretty much now heard what the bad things are uh, mm -hmm. against your side of the aisle or against your case. So you spent a half day, you spent whatever amount of money, short amount of money. Now you know what the other side's uh, position is on the case. And if it can't be resolved, then it has to be tried. I mean, the, there are cases that have to be tried. There's no doubt, but 94% of all cases, the last time I checked in civil anyway, settle. So, and even if you can't settle on the first bounce, if there's some, some tail left to the mediation, maybe you can have a second mediation uh, round, depending on what the issue is, but even if it doesn't prove successful, I think it's it's helpful for the litigator. Uh, completely agree with that. I think you should be prepared to go down both paths. And um, at the end of the day, the the party that has the issue needs to find the best solution for it. And that solution is either going to be delivered by a judge, um, or it's going to be crafted, you know, consensually with the. Uh, assistance of a mediator uh, with the agreement of the other party. So, I mean, you've got two choices, right? So how do you think you're going to fear better? And that comes back to the Batner uh, phrase that Kristen used earlier. What's your best alternative to negotiated resolution? Is it, it may be to have the judge decide, maybe decide in your favor. Of course, there could be appeals and it could be 
for the litigation after that. So you have to give full consideration to what's your best method to get this problem solved. Fantastic. Well, I want to thank all three of you so much for sharing this fantastic feedback. Thank you to everyone on the call who's, who's joined us and who's stayed with us. I know that since I have zero expertise in this area, I have learned a ton. So thank you very much. Um, it's, it's another um, good skill to add to my, to my tool belt. And I hope the same thing is true for everyone else on the call. Um, I'm happy to share these slides with everyone who has come. This has been recorded, so I will be sharing that. Um, with everyone um, who is on this call also, so you can expect an email from me. If you have any direct questions, you can email me at msweeney at holycross.edu. And I want to, I just want to thank you all again for joining us. This has been really, really fantastic. Um, and I hope that you'll join us for another webinar in the future. I know John's got lots of great ideas for yeah. Lawyers Association webinars, so hopefully you'll see us again before too long. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Maura. Thanks for all your help. Thank you, thank you. John and Ed. Thank you, you too. Take care. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.